I just want to explain a little bit about the Works of Art Committee. Um, it may be not widely understood, but actually the Works of Art Committee is at the vanguard of the feminist movement. <laughs> and that's because if you come into Parliament and look around, you will see, especially in the Palace of Westminster itself, you will see a lot of pictures, statues, sculptures and depictions of men's contribution to politics. So since 2007, the Works of Art Committee have been actively acquiring memorabilia, which represents the campaigns for women's suffrage and puts them on public display. And we've had several uh, exhibitions and events to commemorate women's contribution in changing our politics. And this summer, we will have a public exhibition, Voice and Vote, Women's Place in Parliament, which will look at 200 years of women's active involvement in Parliament. Now, to add to that and our um, acquisitions of women who have changed the face of politics, in 2013, this lecture series was established to draw attention to the women who we have got represented in the collection, such as the first uh, subject of, of the, the first lecture that we had, Margot Asquith, um, following the acquisition of her portrait in 2011. And we have also commemorated women who, uh, because of incorrect decisions in the past, are missing from our collection, such as Ellen Wilkinson, MP, who we would love to have a portrait of, but we are yet to even find one. So we've had uh, different lectures in this series, as I've said, covering Margot Asquith, Ellen Wilkinson, Irene Ward, MP, Eleanor Rathbone, MP, and Caroline uh, Norton, who changed law as it affects married women. Just to um, highlight some of our other feminist achievements, in 2016, the committee turned on New Dawn, which is the artwork by Mary Branson, which celebrates the women's suffrage campaign and the ongoing campaign for women's democratic rights. And if you haven't been to see New Dawn, over the um, entranceway to St. Stephen's Chapel. I would really recommend that you do. It's one of the first contemporary works that the committee um, commissioned. It's quite different to some of the other works of art, but commemorates not just one individual, but the whole movement behind women's suffrage. We've also responded to Sarah Child's The Good Parliament Report, which made recommendations to us about how Parliament should become more representative and inclusive. And we did things like abolish the 10-year rule, which meant that portraits could only hang in the Palace of Westminster if the sitter had been dead for 10 years, which obviously discriminated against women. We agreed to audit the collection for diversity in every Parliament, and we are actively investigating ways of increasing the diversity of the collection and encouraging the public to engage with the diversity of the history of Parliament. But ultimately, we will be judged by our deeds, not our words. And there is much to be done before every UK citizen can come into Parliament and see people just like them represented on our walls. So that said, I just want to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Helen Pankhurst, who many in this room will know. She's a women's rights activist and a senior advisor to Care International, working in the UK and in Ethiopia. She's a trustee of ActionAid and a visiting senior fellow at LSE. Her new book, Deeds Not Words, the story of women's rights then and now, has just been published and reveals quite how far women have come since the suffrage campaign, but how far we still have to go. And I'm sure she is going to inform us of those details this evening. Will you put your hands together for Dr. Helen? Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm delighted to be here, uh, head of International Women's Day in the Parliament building. Um, I do feel always that a Pankhurst in a Parliament building there's something slightly surreal, uh, <laughs> slightly seditious about it. Um, and um, yet I'm here and it's wonderful to be so. Um, so what would the suffrage campaigners think about how far we've come? Um, I think that they would say, 
Well, sorry, we're having some people coming in. Um, what, what, would, what would the uh, suffragette say about how much things have changed? In, in this book here, I've attempted to have a serious go at answering that in more detail than I'm usually allowed, because usually that question is uh, some microphone coming near me and uh, a single very short answer. Um, and what I decided to do in this book is not just start in 1918 and say, how far have we got in the last century, but to talk a little bit about how we got to 1918, because how could I start at 1918 without looking at how we got there and the importance of the suffrage movement and all the activism that led us there. So there's a preface um, that looks at just that um, and uh, allows me also to talk a bit about the family engagement and how complicated that story is and the, uh, the diversity of voices that are represented both within the family and beyond. Um, and the interesting thing is that by doing that, um, I'm allowed to bring the suffrage influence right throughout the 100 years because it wasn't as if they got the vote and then that was the end of the story. These same campaigners that were partly behind that movement then continued to influence absolutely every aspect of women's lives, both the personal, uh, the political, in employment, um, in religious spheres, in all sorts of spheres around the, uh, the country. So the suffrage legacy is woven as a as a golden thread right throughout the book, and I think right throughout our sense of what's happened in this country. Um, in the centenary year of that first partial franchise, there are a lot of discussions in the air, and it's actually incredible, it's incredible how visible the centenary has been. I mean, I don't think any of us who've been involved expected quite this level of interest. Um, there is a lot of debate about, you know, was it the ists or the ets that got us it? Um, uh, was it militancy that helped or hindered? Um, how relevant is that bipolar uh, simplification of uh, the, is the its and the ets? You know, how much more complicated was the story? Um, and uh, all of that, I think, is a, is a rich texture to understanding the change subsequently. Um, but what is definitely, definitely the case is however much that might be the subtext. I don't think anybody is saying, when we look at 1918, the person, the organization, the structures that we need to give thanks to are parliament. The focus is on those women activists that got us there. Um, and I think that's really important as we think about the relationship over time, both during the centenary, but even now, about what's the relationship between individual agency, between, between individuals saying things have to change, between social norms changing, attitudes, enough people changing their minds about how a country and how a society should run, and then the legal, the institutional structures. It's that magic between those three factors that are the critical aspect, I think, um, and are really interesting even from the, before we get to 1918. Um, the other interesting fact as we celebrate the centenary is numerically it's as important if not more so that many men were able to vote um, through that act of 1918. Yet we don't really, it's not part of the discussion, it's not part of the visibility of the centenary. Nor arguably was it at the time that the push and the pull and the demand came for women's enfranchisement more than it did for uh, men's. And that's, it's interesting that that parallel continues to this day, that, that the celebration, the noise, the visibility in the media, the questions seem to be about how much things change for women. Um, yeah, another thought is that, you know, why is it that people are so interested now in 2018 about that century? What's going on there? And is it because there's something else in the air right now? Some burgeoning of resistance the Me Too, the Time's Up, every day, every day in the media, there's something that speaks to individuals saying enough is enough, something has to change, something has to give. And is it coincidental? Or is it that you know one, two, three generations down from that act, we have women who've been able to occupy many more spaces through education, through their work, through political spaces, and they are coming across all these continued barriers, and they are feeling that maybe, again, another push, another wave is required. And it really does feel that we are 
we are at one of those moments that 2018 will be remembered not because it's a centenary, but because something else was happening. Um, after the um, <coughs> prologue, which looks at some of these issues, I have uh, five thematic chapters which um, I feel kind of encapsulate the ideas about what's changed for women, what the key aspects are. Um, the first is on women in politics, and it's the one I will talk about the most given this setting. Um, another one, the second chapter, is on women at work, and it's, it's entitled Money, but so it's also about issues of wealth. The third is women's identity, and that's about family and um, personal health and the way women are constructed and perceived in society. The fourth is on violence against women, and the fifth is on culture. And then I have a final chapter of, entitled Power, which, which is slightly different. It's less of a social history, and it's kind of pulling... Um, pulling those issues to a, a more theoretical perspective of understanding power and, and intersectionality, um, meaning the differences that, that cut across, so race, color, color, uh, religion, um, ethnicity, etc. understanding all of those power dynamics. Um, but uh, talking, and I, I, ideally I'd like to talk to you about all of those in a bit more detail, but I'm just gonna focus on the first chapter on power. Um, and so we could celebrate a lot. We could celebrate the fact that we've got some fantastic um, women MPs now, 32% in the Commons, 26% in the Lords, unless it's changed since my last statistics. Um, and we have, you know, which is fantastic, and we've had women in many positions of power, uh, including two uh, prime ministers. But it has been 100 years, and my maths aren't very good, but if we look at per year what percentage change that represents, as a percentage change, it's pretty small. It's very, very small. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at many other, you know, how do we compare how far we've got in politics and the, say, the 32% representation of women? How do we compare that with all, all sorts of other areas of um, change in society? If you look at the technological transformation that we've had, shouldn't we, couldn't we? Don't we have to expect more of our parliamentary system? Um, some, uh, some of the quotes that kind of encapsulate the problems that we've had along the way, uh, one of the ones that um, I kind of find rather chilling was from Earl Ferrers in 1957, so in the context of the House of Lords. And what he said was, why should we encourage women to eat their way like acid into metal? Like acid into metal into positions of trust and responsibility. If we allow women in the house, where will this emancipation end? <laughs> where indeed? Um, so numerically there is change. Um, and as I've said, in certain terms of power, in terms of um, women in authority, we've seen that as well. But it seems to me that the very institution, this institution, the rules, the regulations, who speaks when, how long, um, the kind of people who are brought in as experts, who are valued, valued as experts, the ways of working are still so tradition, tradition bound, uh, literally man-made, and that hasn't changed enough. The whole workings of parliament um, along party lines, which minimize the possibilities of women working across that, a masculine architecture. Um, you know, in a way, you could see the whole structure as having party politics as the pillars and then the whole thing is encapsulated within a structure that is still so traditional. How does women's spirit, how does a feminist spirit operate within all of that? Um, between 1918 and 1928, more than 20 acts were passed um, that had women at their heart. You know, acts around maternity rights, uh, pensions for widows, divorce, the rights to children, all sorts of things started to happen because women, because the, the, the system realized that it had to think about women's no, uh, needs and their policies. And you know, ever since, clearly policies have become more attuned to women, but we don't have a feminist, par we don't have a feminist parliament yet. Um, also, very important to say, it's, this is not about uh, a simplistic male-female division. Clearly there have been many men who have been very strong allies, the current speaker being one. 
um, and uh, a number of others that can be named. Um, so male allies, critical, but male um, dinosaurs, still very much part of the problem. Um, okay, what about the feminist pillars within this institution, within Parliament? What could we highlight as being uh, really important? Um, and it's, it seems rather odd to me. It's not, I'm not a politician and I'm uh, making very um, general, broad sweep generalizations based on the analysis. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of work across the uh, different chapters. But, uh, you know, a caveat this isn't me as an expert, this, but this is my sense of what, what, what comes through the reading. And I would say that there are two critical pillars. One is um, having a, the women's um, ministry. Um, so having a minister for women, um, something that we have Harriet to thank for, and I'm sure she'll be talking about it down the line, um, but, and the name has changed over time, so it's now the Women's Inequality um, uh, Ministry, but uh, you know, it, it, it is keeping the flag flying uh, and calling other departments to account. It's commissioned significant research. Um, however, the portfolio is shunted around as the most appropriate um, female MP, so depending on what's happening with the other um, portfolios, it tends to be moved around, and it is a secondary portfolio, not an independent one in its own right. So potentially one really significant feminist pillar is there, but isn't as powerful as it could be. Likewise, there's a, women's, um, a Women and Equality Select Committee, which is cross-party. It's doing really interesting things. <coughs> comes out with very powerful recommendations, but these tend to be sidelined. Um, and there are many other uh, mechanisms, uh, the all-party parliamentary groups, public appointments, and so on. But still, from the outside, is this where we want to be? I think there's a lot more that we could expect and should expect by now. And the same goes on in, in, in terms of all aspects of the political sphere. So the other, the less rigid, arguably, the less rigid um, other regional assemblies, the legislature, probably just as rigid, um, many other aspects of our democracy. Um, and then there's the media, which is part of the system, um, but Historically, it's the press barons. The press barons were as close to the House of Lords as you could possibly be, and, uh, and more. How, how, how gender neutral could you expect all of that to have been? Um, and then you have um, the BBC, which started off transformational. It, I mean, women directed the first forms of political commentary. In 1929, you had a week in Parliament, which became the week in Westminster. That was commissioned and women were centrally involved in that. Then the Today program in 1956, um, which also, I think, somewhere lost its way in terms of being that pinnacle of a feminist statement and, and, and information. Um, lobby journalists, at last count, 26% uh, of women. And yes, some symbolically really important ones, Laura Kunzberg. Um, but again, um, I don't know what the imagery is, but something to do with layers and layers and layers of uh, reasons why we still haven't got as far as we could. I just wanted to read you a section of this very important book. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, in terms of how the media responds to um, politics, when it involves, this is a, a quote from the book, this is me reading from the book for the moment, when it involves women, the topic under consideration is trivialized and sexualized. 43 main recommendations were made in the Good Parliament report, the one that we were just hearing about earlier, uh, in 2016. The media zoned in on breastfeeding, which had been mentioned as a sub-point to a proposal for a clear policy on maternity, paternity, adoption and care leave. As the former minister and Liberal Democrat MP Joe Swinson commented, quote, it's a journalist equivalent of pinging a, gir a girl's bra strap and thinking it's hilarious. Boobs! They mentioned boobs! <laughs> you can almost hear the plural chuckles in the newsroom. Television, radio and newspaper, newspapers link citizen and state and play a central role in people's lives. For most of the last century, the media could fail, would fail a gender neutral test in terms of who, what and how the news has been reported. 
some individuals, institutions and networks have continued the drumbeat for women's rights and the democratization of society from the gender perspective. Yet overall, the media presents more as obstacle than solution. Um, finally, in my, uh, my opinion, the other aspect of the democratic space, political space for women, is um, the role of civil society the absolutely critical role of civil society in pushing the feminist agenda. And there are many studies, including an international one, that look at how important that is. And I have argued that actually it's more important than the number of women in Parliament, that if you have a really healthy civil society in which women are voicing their needs, that above all is pivotal. Yet the problem is that it's, the, its relationship with government is, some, is often slightly instrumental and I think it's, it's not valued as much as it should be. Um, I wanted to read one other short section of this very important book. Um, which one did I want to read? That's okay. uh, yeah, so on, on that about uh, women's organization and activism, when we think of politics, all these diverse forms of women's activism are rarely put center stage yet often in invisible ways, they have continuously, in very different forms, nourished the democratic sphere. Although women's activism in these various forms persists, the fear is that the voluntarism on which it depends is under threat, for many reasons, including women's increased role in formal politics and in the paid economy, the busyness of life, and the increased demands and shrinking resources of the voluntary sector. Something is going to have to give if the contributions of millions of women is going to be part of the ongoing story of social change. Um, so a lot and a lot of quotes actually more in the other chapters about from women's voices on these different areas um, and quite a lot of statistics and I felt at the end of each chapter it was quite useful to kind of think well so how far have we gone just in a simplistic way how do we measure how far we've got and I just want to try an exercise with you that I, I have done. So at the end of each chapter, I've actually scored the chapter from zero to five. Zero would mean we are at exactly the same place as we were 100 years ago. Five would mean we've got equality. Could you just put your fingers up and give me a number? So if you put zero, I know it's zero. If you put five, it's five. Just all of you, just put your fingers up. For this area of politics, what would you say? Just fingers up, all of you. I've got a one two, threes, threes, twos, threes, 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 threes. I think I'd go for probably an average of three. Um, so that's quite interesting. It, it kind of, it's roughly with that 32% as well, isn't it? Um, and in a way, I think what that's often picking up um, is numeric equality rather than some of these other deeper questions of transformation and understanding of difference. Um, I've scored each of the chapters, and I'm not, uh, because of time, because I think I'm probably running out now, is that right? Um, and any, yep, okay, so I'm running out, so I'm not going to do that for um, uh, any of the others. But I think what I would love, how much time have I got? Have I got less than one minute? I'm going to have to close. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to say one last thing. The book ends with an epilogue, so just as I couldn't start at 1918, I couldn't stop in 2018. And where I'd like to stop is 2028, because 2028 takes us to the centenary of equal franchise. That gives us a decade. We, that's us, that's everybody in this room. We have a decade of action. We have 10 years to do the best that we can. And the book ends with some quotes about what people would like to see um, change. And I hope that we can all think about what we would like to see change in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, that was fascinating. Um, I want to introduce now um, the, uh, the main lecturer for um, this evening, uh, who is uh, the Right Honourable Harriet Harman, MP. Um, Harriet was first elected in 1982. I was one. <laughs> <laughs> so to say Harriet has been an inspiration for all my life is literally true. Um, then, there were just 10 Labour member of Parliament, 10 women Labour members of Parliament. I mean, I mean, Sharon Hodgson's one of my women colleagues, is like, hey, can you imagine what that would have been like? You know, the women's PLP, 
which now we can barely get in one room, would hardly fit round one table. So Harriet has played an absolutely central role in changing that and radically increasing the number of women MPs. But her life in politics hasn't stopped there. She served um, for a long time in the cabinet in 1997. She was Secretary of State for Social Security and in 2001 she became the first woman Solicitor General. Um, important to those of us in my party, however, uh, in 2007 she was elected our deputy leader and her place in being one of our elected leadership team was absolutely crucial in changing things for women in our party and she was there in 2015 to serve as leader of the opposition. She is the longest continuously serving woman MP. So in terms of somebody who knows most about how far we have come, we couldn't ask for a better speaker this evening. Her career is an absolutely unique insight into the experience of women in Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, Harriet Harman. Um, thanks very much and a very warm uh, welcome to all of you here and, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. Um, 8,500 works of art in the Commons and in the Lords, it's a considerable and important collection on behalf of the public and going back over 150 years, even longer than I've been a Member of Parliament. And I want to acknowledge the dedication and commitment of the Speaker's Advisory Committee and the work in particular of Melanie Unwin and her team uh, and the careful thought that you dedicate to this collection and to commissioning for the future. And I want to pay tribute too to Frank Doran who died at the end of last year who was such a passionate chair of the Advisory Committee. We all miss him greatly and how poignant it was that just this month you, you unveiled your latest portrait of his widow, Joan Ruddock. It's, that portrait's hanging downstairs. It's a wonderful portrait which captures perfectly Joan's combination of serenity and steel. Um, I miss her after all the years she devoted to this house and it's great to have Sharon here with us, Sharon Hodgson. Uh, I want to thank Ali McGovern, um, who's now your chair. Ali is equally at home in an art gallery or on a football terrace, here in the corridors of Westminster or in the hard-pressed estates in her Wirral constituency. She's all over domestic policy as well as international policy and I really regard her as without doubt a renaissance woman and a daughter of the women's movement, not my daughter but definitely a daughter of the women's movement and there could be no better person to chair the committee which preserves the past but looks to the future um, as we all ensure our approach reflects the changing times and it's great to be here with Helen Pankhurst and I'm honestly really envious of your name, Helen. It is the name to have, Pankhurst rather than Harm. And I feel I should change my name by deed poll, especially uh, in this year that we mark 100 years since the first women got the vote. And in the week, this week, we celebrate International Women's Day. It's right to recognise that one of the most significant changes that's happened is in the role of women uh, at work, in the family and in Parliament. Now, it's hard to describe to you younger folk how different things were in the world as it was when I was growing up as a girl in the 1950s. I think some of you looking around will be able to remember this, but you know, the messages to a girl were very clear. The most important ambition was to get a husband. That was the most important ambition. And once you'd achieved that lofty ambition, to serve and support that husband. And that's what my mother, like so many in her generation, did. She was very unusual, though, in that she qualified as a barrister. Um, but of course, when she married my dad, um, she had achieved a higher purpose and gave up being a barrister in order to uh, be his housewife. And I look back now and remember and feel it's quite poignant that her wig and gown were in our dressing up box. And that's the way it was. But the 
the women's movement swept through women of my generation. And this was in all regions of this country, in Scotland and in Wales. It was women from all walks of life, women in trade unions, in business, from the academia to the law. And it was an enormous and profound movement. And what it did is it challenged the notion that women were inferior to men, challenged the notion that we should be subordinate to men, um, challenged the notion that we should define ourselves through our husbands, but that we should somehow be people in our own right. And when I say define ourselves in terms of our husbands, that's really what it was like. Um, I used to always look at envelopes that came through the letterbox um, to our house that uh, was addressed to Mrs. John, Har Mrs. John Harmon. My mum had literally uh, vanished, but that's the way it was. Um, not only did you take his name, sometimes his first name as well as his second name, but you promised to obey in the marriage vows. He didn't promise to obey you, but you promised to obey him. Um, and it was his responsibility to be head of the household and keep the household in order, including keep the wife in order, with a slap if necessary, uh, because actually uh, that was what his responsibility was. Um, and women's responsibility was to cook after, to cook his supper, look after him, and look after the children. And I remember as the women's movement was really gathering pace, um, and I was back at home, uh, in a holiday from university. And at this point, my mother, because we were a bit more grown up, had started retraining as a solicitor. Um, and I remember one morning um, coming down and my dad was reading the newspaper at the table, uh, waiting as she cooked his breakfast, and that was kippers. So there was an awful smell emanating from the cooker. But she was also cooking his supper um, which was curry, so there was another terrible smell emanating from the cooker. And she had, because she was, had to cook his supper because she was going to go out for, to work to be at the College of Law to train as a solicitor during the day, and she had a law book propped up on the back of the cooker. And I remember feeling that really strong sense that this was not for me, and it wasn't going to be for women uh, of our generation. So I came into Parliament as a, a fervent participant in the women's movement, a movement whose aim was literally to change everything about women and men's lives. And we wanted to share. We wanted to share in every sector. We wanted to participate in science, in the arts, in private companies, in public services, in the law and in education. We wanted to be out there in the world of work as well as just being at home. And we wanted men to be in the world of the home as well as being out there in the world of work. You know, they are your children too. We wanted men to change how they related to the world of work. And we wanted to share in making our laws and running the country. So we had to get into Parliament. We had to break into the male preserve of the House of Commons. The women's movement, as I said, their ambition, our ambition was to literally change everything. Now, Parliament is described as a representative parliament, a representative democracy. But at that time, when I was first came into Parliament in 1982, it was profoundly unrepresentative. There was 97% men and only 3% women. I mean, there was not a single person who wasn't white in the House of Commons. Um, women's voices were not heard. Women played no part in shaping the agenda. And the aim of the women's movement was not to try and succeed on men's terms, but to change the terms. Not to play by the rules, but to get in and change the rules. So, um, I came into the House of Commons in 1982 um, as a devoted member of the Labour Party, who we thought was very far from putting women on equal footing with men, but who we wanted to transform the party as well into being genuinely the party of women and equality and be the political wing of the women's movement. But I was 
very um, out of place. I felt very out of place, and I was. Um, as I came in after a by-election, pushing open those enormous, huge, heavy doors into the House of Commons and seeing all the serried ranks of the men in grey suits banked up on those green benches, feeling that I really was out of place, and I was standing there as I was in a red velvet maternity dress. Um, and the, the women's movement was always about, as Helen said, about solidarity, about achieving change by working together. But really, there was virtually no one for me to work with there. There were a whole load of young women who'd stood for Parliament in the Labour Party, but we did so badly in the 1983 election that I was re-elected, but uh, none of them were. And that was very hard. It was very hard being a new MP and a new mother. Um, when I was first elected, I had a huge post bag. Um, the by-election had attracted uh, a lot of um, attention, as in the way that by-elections nearly always do. And I had an enormous post bag when I arrived in the House of Commons. And half of it was from women saying, good on you, get out there, you know, speak up for us, that's fantastic, you're a member of Parliament. And half of them were saying, what are you doing? You will ruin your children. They will play truant from school. And the problem was that I couldn't be sure that they weren't right. For our generation, whose mothers had been stay-at-home mothers or had worked part-time, and whose whole focus was on the family, it was a worrying thing to be doing things so differently. So I was very haunted by all those people who were saying that I was doing the wrong thing. And then amongst um, members of parliament, helpful members of parliament would tell me, you know, don't, don't talk about women all the time, don't get pigeonholed, um, don't, don't bang on about domestic violence and childcare, show you understand the really important parts of the political agenda <laughs> about, about the money supply, about the motorways and the mines. And with a combination of feeling incredibly out of pl a place, all the sisterhood that I was expecting to work collectively in the House of Commons with not being there, haunted by maternal guilt, very often I wanted to give it all up. But I never did and was never able to for two reasons. Firstly, because there was such strong support for the idea of women getting into the House of Commons through, as Helen says, uh, women in civil society. So everywhere I went, down any street, on any train or bus, there were women coming up to me saying, we know what you're doing, stick in there, you know, keep on doing it. So I felt all the uh, difficulties in the House of Commons, but also all the massive support by the women's movement outside of the House of Commons. And once you've picked up a flag and said, well, we as women, we can do it, we can go out to work, we can come into the House of Commons, you can't say, sorry, it's all too much, because then it would have been a massive setback and everybody would have said, see, that's what happens when you elect a women MP, they can't hack it. So basically, I had to actually keep going. And we tried, as women in the Labour Party, we tried everything to get more Labour women into the House of Commons. So first of all, we tried making the argument, in principle, actually it's right that women should be not discriminated against, that we were the party that believed in equality, that must apply to women. Well, a few people disagree, a few people agreed with us, but it didn't really make any change. So then we thought, we'll have to change the rules. So we made the proposal that on every shortlist for a member of parliament uh, to stand as a Labour ca a candidate, there'd have to be at least one woman on every shortlist, because characteristically, it was all men shortlists. So we said, we've got to have one woman in every shortlist. It was absolute riot and controversy. It was regarded as really offensive and critical to men that we should have this rule change. So there was a huge controversy and a huge backlash, but we won that rule change and it made absolutely no difference at all <laughs> because all the men got selected. So then, 
we thought again and we thought, okay, we'll get another proposal. 50% of every shortlist will have to be women. Riots broke out amongst the men. Absolute fury, backlash, controversy, even hatred that we should come forward with such a hostile proposal. But we got it through the Labour Party conference, we got the change, and it made no difference at all, <laughs> because the 50% of the shortlist that was men got selected. So that's when we resorted to all women shortlists. And at this point, we were making the argument that actually um, we couldn't get elected unless we got women's support. So we needed women's support to get into government and they wouldn't support us if we looked like a party which was of and for men. And the electoral argument persuaded many of our male colleagues that actually we did have to recognise that we needed to get more Labour women into Parliament. And Neil Kinnock, um, in particular, was a strong supporter of the idea of having more women um, in the Labour Party in the House of Commons. And that's how we got to all women shortlists, which feel like a very difficult measure to have taken. To be saying to a local constituency Labour Party, you are the local Labour Party, you're going to fight to get your candidate elected, it's your choice, and you can choose anybody you want so long as it's not a man. It <laughs> felt really quite difficult, and there was, again, even more hostility and even more backlash. Um, a lot of it raining down on my head, but uh, as women in the Labour Party, we were very um, determined and embattled, and that's what made the difference. So that when we got to 1997, suddenly, having started off as one of 10 Labour women, I think I was the 11th, suddenly there was 100. And I cannot describe the change it was. It changed not only the face and the look of Parliament, and by the way, at that time, the press lobby was 95% men. In the Parliament when I came in, which was 97% men, it was reported on by a press lobby, which was 95% men. And suddenly we had all these women in the House of Commons um, determined to press forward on an agenda for women. And that's what made the difference um, in our government from 1997. Suddenly, childcare was a political issue. Suddenly, domestic violence was on the agenda for the Home Office. We doubled maternity pay and leave. We brought in the Equality Act. So great strides were made. And people often uh, ask about women in the House of Commons, well, do you work together um, as women across parties? Because there is this sense of female solidarity in the women's movement. And there was a limited amount of working together across parties on, between women, for example, on things like the hours of the House of Commons um, and defending abortion rights. Um, but outside of a couple of issues like that, there really was no basis uh, for cross-party working. There were so few women on our side, as I say, only 10 to start with, even fewer on the Tory side. And we were like a different breed from them. We were feminists wanting to change everything about the way the family, the world of work and politics operated. They were conservative, um, the party of the traditional family, decrying rights at work as a burden on business, believing that childcare was, if anything, a private responsibility, not res the responsibility of government at national or local level. And actually, in relation to the House of Commons, the few women that there were were older, either um, their children having grown up um, or having never had them. Um, but things have really, really changed. And they've changed in a number of ways. They've changed because of the numbers. You know, Labour has now got a really big number, more than 100 um, Labour women MPs. And with the new intakes we've had um, in 2010, in 2015, in 2017, we've got women in every region of the country, in Scotland, in Wales. We've got women of all ages. Uh, we've got younger women as well as older women. It's a common sight to see women, as Ali was, um, looking wonderful with her bump, uh, pregnancy bump in the division lobby. Um, so we've got 
big numbers of Labour women, but we've also got more women on all sides of the House, and this is a real marked difference, so that we now have over 200. And it's not just the numbers, but it's the different sorts of women who are, the different breed of women who are now in the House of Commons, who I would describe as daughters of the women, women's movement, very different from the Tweedy matrons of earlier days. Um, and so it's not just the numbers, it's the sort of women who are now um, Tory MPs, who are much more in tune with the feminist agenda, but also because a change in men in the House of Commons. Now, when I was first in the House of Commons, honestly, to be a male MP was to be very important, so important that you had to delegate all your family responsibilities to your supportive wife. Her place was in the home whilst his was in the house. And the idea of a man supporting the women's agenda seemed almost inconceivable. And I certainly never thought I'd see the day when there were MPs in the house um, who instead of expecting their wife to shoulder all the responsibility of their family while well, they're being important in the House of Commons, recognise and respect their wife and their partner for what they're doing outside the home as well as what they're doing inside the home. I mean, literally, I thought I would never see the day, but new man has arrived in the House of Commons. <laughs> and actually then, when you think of it, the large numbers of women on Labour's side added to with increasing numbers of a new breed of women on the conservative side, plus the support of some new men. You know, we are no longer on our own as feminists um, in the Labour Party, and of course there are women in the SNP and other parties as well. So we have new possibilities for women working together across the House and with supportive men of taking the quest of equality for women to a whole new level. There's a woman, and it's not just we're here in significant numbers, we're still outnumbered, but we're no longer on the margins. There's a woman prime minister. There are women on the front benches of all parties in senior positions. Women are chairing important select committees, select committees for treasury, for business, for home affairs. Um, sorry, for the Public Accounts Committee, for Environment, for Transport. Um, now, we've said, elect us as women and we will make a difference for women's lives. And if we don't, then actually what has been the point of us? And if with 208 women MPs, it will be a failing if, we, if women out there in the rest of the country are still tearing their hair out about childcare, continuing to face endemic pregnancy discrimination, um, suffering domestic violence, and protesting about sexual harassment and unequal pay. So for us, the change in the House of Commons is not just an opportunity, it's more than that, it's an obligation. For us women, who are now here in Parliament, we have to find ways to work together to improve women's lives. And I think we've got to be united in our defence of women who are subjected to trolling and misogyny, especially online. The threats and abuse of women MPs must be resisted by all of us as nothing less than attack on our democracy. No woman should have to put up with abuse and threats. Threats. It's a genuine danger to women. After all, one of our women MPs, our absolutely beloved Jo Cox, was murdered less than two years ago. But we should also recognise that it's an attempt to silence women, to punish women who have the temerity to speak out, especially if they've got the temerity to be young and not white. This is an attack on our democracy, and we should see it as such. The voters are entitled to re elect whoever they want. And once that person is elected, they must be able to do their work without let or hindrance. They're the voice of their constituents, and that constituency has the right to be heard through their MP. So we must tackle this, not just in the name of the women MPs who suffer it, 
but actually in the name of our democracy. And the other thing is, we must not, I believe, in our enthusiasm to fight against inequality in all its m ugly manifestations, fall into the notion that there is somehow a hierarchy of inequalities, that some inequalities are more important than others, more worth fighting for, that somehow it's not good enough to fight only against one aspect of inequality, and that those who don't fight against every aspect of inequality are not worthy at all. The point is that all discrimination is abhorrent, all prejudice is repugnant, all inequality, whatever its basis, is unfair. And we should encourage and support each other, whatever we're doing, to challenge any sort of inequality or prejudice. We shouldn't be judging each other we must judge the misogynists, the racists, the homophobes, and those who oppress the disabled. It's wrong to set the fight against inequality based on class, for example, as somehow against the fight against inequality rooted in gender. You don't advance the fight for equality by setting the fight against racism against the fight against gender inequality. I would never say to the person who fights for the disabled, but you've never fought against homophobia. The point is, if they fight it, fit, fight, fought for the rights of the disabled, that is important. And I'd never say to the man who fights against racism, but you've never fought for women's rights, and therefore you're not doing the right thing. Um, let's not say to the woman at the BBC that the unequal pay there doesn't matter as they're well paid. We would never say um, rape or domestic homicide doesn't matter if it's a middle class woman. We'd s never say that it doesn't matter that a well played, paid black man is lower paid than his white colleague because he's still well off. We would hate the racial prejudice that underlied that. We hate discrimination and prejudice, whatever form it takes, and we should lord those who fight against it, whatever the aspect they focus on, and actually support and encourage each other and not judge each other, but actually focus on those who are the pressers, not actually argue amongst ourselves. It's been a long struggle for women to make our way into Parliament, but the essence of being an MP is that we're here not for ourselves, but for others, to represent them and to improve their lives. Sometimes, after decades of being outsiders, it's hard to recognise that you've won. Women have won the argument to be here. We have. We've won the argument for equality. We've changed the mood, but now we've got to change the reality. And that's another story.